uh, stimulus catalysts, if you like, to, to move our market either way. I mean, the things like the FOMC meeting, I mean, are these the sorts of things, G20 potential uh, policy announcements, are these the things that the market is likely to, to use as some sort of impetus one way or the other? Tuesday, Wednesday is the FOMC meeting and this is going to be important for markets. In fact, we've already seen gold prices starting to move and gold miners were the big winners today. We saw Newcrest up by 2.2% on speculation that we will see a positive outcome for risk assets from that FOMC meeting. And the magic word that markets are looking out for is quantitative easing. We know that QE1 and QE2 has a, had a positive impact on risk assets. We have a look at QE1 which ran from June 2008 all the way up to November. November 2010, uh, actually November 2008 to June 2010, it had a positive impact on commodities. In particular, copper prices ran 63% during that time. So in a commodity-based market like Australia, we'll be watching that FOMC meeting very carefully. QE2 didn't have quite the power of QE1 in terms of the impact on risk assets. We saw copper prices up by 12% there, but of course the speculation started a bit earlier in September. So when we have a look from September, we did see copper prices rising around about 22%. So th this FOMC meeting is going to be keenly watched uh, by st the stock market, but especially those uh, shareholders in that material space. Unfortunately, oil prices, though, did come under pressure. We saw energy, the worst performing area on the market today. We saw Woodside and Origin Energy down more than 1%. And of course, as the European crisis is once again in the spotlight, oil prices suffering from uh, perceptions that we will see a downturn in demand from slower global global growth. Um, but altogether, on the market today, not too much happening. Absolutely dismal volumes, $3 billion being traded. And to give you an idea of what that's like in terms of average uh, values traded throughout 2012, that's 30% below the average value traded this year, which has been declining year after year over the last few years. Julia, look, I want to get back to sort of today's market action in just a minute, but it, you, you brought up the, the idea of QE3 and something obviously the, the market very much has been uh, hoping for more than I suppose expecting. But correct me if I'm wrong, hasn't the Australian market underperformed when we have seen quantitative easing in the past? Yes, it's been great for the US equities, European equities and a lot of those sort of uh, risk weighted assets like commodities, but the Australian market hasn't quite reached those dizzying heights. You're absolutely right, James. Throughout QE3, we saw the Australian market rising around about 7%. Um, of course, this was also the time of the Lehman Brothers collapse, so there were other factors weighing in. But QE2, you would have expected the Australian market to have a much bigger impact. And if we have a look at the impact that QE2 had on the Aussie share market, well, our market was only up by 2.5% during that time. And I guess the flip side of quantitative easing is what it does is it weakens the US currency. Basically, it's referred to as money printing, devaluing the US currency. And the flip the side of that is the strength in the Australian currency that we saw throughout QE1 as well as QE2. That high Australian dollar, a key headwind for a lot of Australian companies that export and get overseas revenues. So the flip side to quantitative easing is the strength of the Aussie, Aussie dollar and how hard and fast that's going to rise and that could undo any of the good that we see on the Australian share market. Stock news that we had about today. Uh, Julie, a lot of focus on Echo's shares. We saw a big, I think about 2% of the stock uh, trade today coming off the back and use uh, Genting Genting, uh, this Malaysian investor, has continued to build up its stake. A lot of interest in this stock at the moment. Yeah, shareholders are watching out for a takeover war over Echo Entertainment and I guess the value of Echo comes from its uh, long-term licenses in Queensland as well as New South Wales. Queensland obviously an attractive market for that VIP Asian uh, base and if we have a look at Sydney well there's been a ma massive capital expenditure spe spend in uh, the star and that's expected to continue to flow into the coffers as the benefits of that capital expenditure flow through but of course that uh, that license in Sydney is the only one in Sydney. If we have a look at what happened today, we saw a large parcel of shares going through about 2% of the stock. And this was done by CIMB, which of course is a Malaysian uh, bank. And the speculation is it was on behalf of Genting. Yeah. Genting, of course, we know that the Hong Kong subsidiary has uh, recently shown up on the share register with a 2.8% stake. And we also know another subsidiary of Genting has 4.9% stake. So if you include the 2% stake, that takes the stake up to 9.7%. Now the constitution of ECHO says that any entity can't hold more than 10%. That's where Crown is at the moment. Crown's already applied to the regulator to exceed that 10% mark. So it does look like, a, I, 
guess, the battle over echo heating up. But despite this, we did see the shares falling 1.9% today.